Tell him what you want. Oh, Jesus is on the pain line. Tell him what you want. You just call him up and tell him what you want. Yeah, you just call him up. Call him up. Tell him what you want. Because we're looking for some of us, let's be honest, Lord, we're looking for brighter tomorrows. We're looking for family members to get right. We're looking for the bank account to be overflowing. We're looking for food to be in the cupboard. We're looking for bodies to go back to full health. We're looking for relationships to get better. We're looking for a job to be right there ready. We're looking for the government to finally get their act together. We're looking, dear Lord, for those who are hungry to be fed. We're looking for the naked to get clothed. We're looking for those who are incarcerated to get out, but then at the same time be visited while in. We're looking for so much, Lord, and in the name of Jesus. We come into your house Sunday after Sunday, also with a spirit of looking and longing. And dear Lord, simply wanting something that we don't feel that we have. We want something different. My prayer is that different is also better. But even in the midst of while we're waiting for something different, we also come into your house, dear God, with a mindset to give you praise for things even being as they are. Yeah. It makes no sense, dear Lord, to the rest of the world, mm -hmm. but to the faithful, yeah. even the worst situations have brought some joy somehow because it caused us to depend on you. Yeah. Even those moments where we had to scratch our heads and wonder why we got out of the way, and guess who showed up right on time? Yeah. A God who is an all time God, yes he is. Dear Lord, even when we were hurting the one who made us feel better, rubbed us on the back and let us know, you're still my child. That's the kind of God we serve. It doesn't make any sense to the rest of the world, but that's why even today, with tears in our eyes and with frustrations that dog us, we come into your house still with a mind to say, thank you, Lord, for being so good. Thank you, Lord, for being so kind. Thank you, Lord, for being so merciful. Jesus. We lay these old burdens down. Yeah. But we're going to 
expectation mm -hmm. that in due season yes, that everything is going to be all right. Yeah. Don't know when it's going to be all right, but we know it's going to be all right. Yes, and we give you praise already. Right. And so, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you. Even with tears in our eyes, we say thank you. Thank you. Even with bodies aching, we say thank you. thank you. Even when we're still mad at somebody, we still say thank you. Thank you. And we give you glory, honor, and praise because we know you will work it out. You will fix it. You will patch it up. You'll make it all brand new in your due time. Dear Lord, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, these burdens here today, we're going to lay them down. We pick up praise and we go forward strong. In thy son's name, let every heart simply say amen. 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 And amen. Amen. Call him up. Call him up. Tell him what you want. Amen, amen, amen. So as we go forward here today, not knowing about the extenuating elements of what is to be, I, I want to press on with where we are right now. I want you, if you don't mind, look at Matthew chapter number 14. Very familiar passage of scripture. Matthew chapter number 14. Here in this particular passage of scripture, we find that there is an answer for many of the ups and downs that we might face in our lives. And I am not above thinking that for many of us, the mindset is if you don't acknowledge the difficulties, then they don't exist. And I, I, I respect that thinking. However, it makes no sense. It makes no sense when you move yourself so much so that you're detached from how can you thank God for what he brought you through when you don't even face the fact that you have been into something. Come on. Well, Amen. See, I don't fool myself in thinking that I was just born saved. Okay. He had to do something in my life because I was ragged. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that he loved me enough mm -hmm. to take my reality. I didn't have to deny it. I didn't have to act like it wasn't real. No, reality is what, it is, what we make it be, but God is the one who guides us through it all. And so, here in our text, this is one of those passages of scripture. We've shared it over the years. You've heard this Sunday school lesson for, for many, many years, but let's look at it here for just a few minutes. Matthew, the 14th chapter, starting at verse number 15. Starting at verse number 15. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals and food. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. All right. mm -hmm. He said, bring them hither to me. Mm -hmm. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his multitude and, the multi and to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Mm -hmm. And they did all eat. Mm -hmm and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. Mm -hmm. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men mm -hmm. beside mm -hmm. women and children. Mm -hmm. I want to talk for just a few minutes from the idea of the importance of leftovers. Right. The importance of leftovers. <laughs> 
importance of leftovers. And so, God, we thank you for this day and for this moment. This moment, dear Lord, where we come into your house and we just want to we just want to share a word of encouragement for us all. We're grateful for this moment. We're grateful for what you do. Grateful for what you've done. But dear Lord, there, there are some moments that we just want to dismiss as not being worthy to be remembered or recalled. Sometimes, dear Lord, those are the blessings that we miss out on. There are people who are sometimes made to feel like leftovers. There are situations that are remnants of, of, of brighter days. But dear Lord, there's a, there's a blessing in that help us to share a word that might encourage, that might strengthen us, but at the same time, let us share it in a way that all of us be blessed. Mm -hmm. Now, dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer, and my friend. Mm -hmm. This I do ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, let your word go forth this day, I pray in thy son's name. Amen. 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 Amen, amen, amen. The importance of leftovers. The importance of leftovers. So here we find that when the scraps are thrown away, Sister Jones has an uncle, Jack, who has a farm up in Canton. And when the boys were smaller, had an opportunity to take some food up there that was sitting on the side, and the kids were there, and they threw the scraps into the pen where the hogs were. He had bulls and cows and chickens and all of that. And, and so when they threw the scraps in, Lord, you should have seen them hogs going at it. <laughs> oh, it was a feast for them. Half in the mud with some hay inside their stall areas. They had shade. But when you threw them scraps, whoa, they was going at it. That was some smorgasbord kind of food. That was, that was good stuff right there. And we would watch them as they enjoyed what to them was the best of the best. For many of us, the scraps in our lives are that which we discard. Which, which, that which we get rid of or, or throw away. And here's where, and I'll even give you another personal example. Do you know that some say that potted meat is actually the scraps of good food? And so they put it all together. They throw it in a blender and they chew it up, grind it up, and they put it in the little cans. 68 cents a can. Reverend Jones buys them all. And Sister Jones told me once, that's not right, it's not good for your heart, it's not good for your health. I said, it's not good for you to be in the room right now, you need to leave God bless you. You're messing up my pot of meat, cracker meal. Amen. And if you act like you don't know what I'm talking about, shame on you. So here's where we find that those scraps, sometimes, if that's all you got, you make the most of it. Pope rhymes ain't the best, it's the scraps when you do it right. Things that are left over, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to mess up your Thanksgiving bubble, but chickens is just guts left over. I don't care how you look at it. Praise the Lord, amen. Better get some hot sauce and some happy folks in the church house. Praise the Lord. Take it off you look like you at the front of the table. Praise the Lord. And so here's where we find ourselves looking at scraps from a lens of things to be discarded. But it has been those creative people who take scraps and turn them into something better. It's amazing how many high dollar restaurants you'll go to and they'll have on the menu spiced Chitterlings. We throw it away, call it scraps. On the north side of town, they're using it as delicacy. Here's where your opinion of scraps needs to change. And in our text, it's that beautiful story that we've heard so many times. It's, it's not only one of those stories that is a blessing here right now, but it is one of the few stories that is made mention in each of the four Gospels. Not only in our text here, but also in Mark 4th chapter, Luke 9th chapter, and John the 6th chapter. But it is only in this text that we find that the feeding of the 5,000 and some of the numbers do change depending on which text you read. But here what we find is they tell the story of 12 baskets of food. Scraps, that is. 
after just so many people were fed with, as it says, a few loaves of bread, five loaves, and two small fishes. My friends, Here's where Jesus is saying to his disciples and to everyone else because their focus, even in verse number 15, Lord, we need to let them go because they're in a desert place right now. There's no water for them to be able to have something to cool themselves. There's no food around because there are no shops for them to feed themselves. Let them go, Lord, so that they can go and buy in the marketplace what they need. We have about 5,000 plus in this particular space. And their mind, they just thought the people should have come to hear a word from the Lord. Mm. But here is where Jesus takes this to be a moment and says, don't tell them to leave. And they say, well, Lord, you know they've got a day's travel to get back home. And you blessed their heart. And some of them have accepted you as the, as the Savior. And here it is, Lord. What we want you to do is let them go home. The disciples are thinking only in human terms. <laughs> Jesus understands our human condition. But you do know he's bigger than any human condition we have to face. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus takes this to be that prime moment where he says simply, just tell them to sit down. It's time to eat. I can imagine some of the disciples probably had what is technically known spiritually in the Bible as a hissy fit. Some of them got a real mad. Here it is. We got to let these people leave so that they can go get themselves some food. We got to let them get down the road. We don't have anything for them. We didn't have anything in our church budget to be feeding folks after this worship service. We didn't have nobody to cook some ribs. We didn't have nobody to bring some bottled water. We don't have anything, Jesus. We didn't prepare for this. Jesus says, have them to sit down. Well, they complied. And the people weren't listening to the disciples anyway. They didn't come for the disciples. They came to hear Jesus. And so here, they began to sit down. One of the other gospels says as they sit down in groups of mass numbers. And here's where the greatest blessing is. They try to prove, the disciples try to prove that we don't have enough for this many people. Some of them went out in the crowd, as we know it in the other text, and it says, well, we didn't find any food. And they bring a little boy who has his lunch, and they bring him to Jesus. They didn't even strive to try to find big numbers worth of They went and found a little kid who had a lunch and brought him to Jesus. How many of us as church folks in church situations have been made to realize that we are undercutting our own possibilities because we play the game of trying to make it seem like God cannot provide? And here is where they put this, not even in the challenge of the Lord, they didn't even try. I think they were just lazy. They didn't even want it to work out. They just wanted the folks to leave because guess what? I don't know if you all know this or not, but after every church meal we have, when everybody else leaves full, there's usually only two or three people who are sitting around cleaning up after. Amen. Amen. Those are the ones who are the real willing workers, but sometimes even they get tired also. Yes. And here it is, we find that those willing workers at this point were just tired. We've got all these people, and here it is. We've heard a word, Lord, we're just tired. They go out and they find a little boy. It says here in verse number 17, and it doesn't even mention a little boy. One of the other church, one of the other texts tells it in such a beautiful way. But here it is. They find somebody here. They got the well, they've got now five loaves of bread and two small fishes. Lord, that's all we got. And one of the other scriptures says, But what is that amongst for so many? So here Jesus looks at them and says, look like it's the right amount for me. <laughs> Jesus said, bring it to me. Amen. Whatever looks disappointing to folks, bring it to me. Whatever looks like it ain't going to meet the need, bring it to me. Whatever makes it seem like you're going to lose this battle, bring it to me. Jesus says, bring it to me. And I don't know how he did it. I don't know. I've always imagined in my mind that I see Jesus doing something, and nobody sees what he's doing, but he's handing out food. We had rolls of bread and fishes, and he's just passing it out. And every time he's passing it out, they got baskets of food going here and there, and here. 5,000 men plus women and children. How did he do it? I don't know. 
But the scripture said it got done. Yeah. And at the end of all of this food, mm -hmm. folks sat back and said, you know, that was some of the best food I've had in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't never had fish like that. Yeah. Bread never tasted so good. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the Lord provided, didn't it? Yeah. They didn't see what the miracle was, but the disciples saw the miracle. And here it is, we see God is on the move yeah. providing for his people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they leave. Fat, full, and happy. And when they leave out, Jesus says to those disciples, now let's clean up the scraps. And they gathered 12 baskets full, large trash cans, if you will, of scraps that came from five loaves of bread and two small fishes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My mathematics ain't that good, but that just don't make no sense to me. That's an issue of multiplication and division that actually has a quantum leap over to something that trigonometry can't even explain that make any sense. How can you get so much from something so little? And I guess the answer is when you put things into the hands of the Lord and let the Lord work it out. You can always see great things happen. And so if there be any points that I want to share with you, as we look at the importance of these leftovers, mm -hmm. let them be clear with you here today. The first thing I want you to know is that Jesus can handle your right now situation. Yes, Lord. Sometimes we're always working hard to dismiss what's happening in your life right now. Guess what? Whether it's super good or, or kind of bad, I want you to know that Jesus can handle your right now situation. Yes, the disciples thought they should come and get the sermon. And in believing in the Lord, that can change their lives. Mm -hmm. But here's what we found is that getting the sermon wasn't the issue. They showed their faces and they, they showed upon their faces their weariness and their tiredness and their posture was beginning to stoop. The disciples wanted them to leave to get sustenance. Jesus said, I give them everything they need right here. Yeah. He can handle your right now situation. If you're frustrated, he can handle that. He can move on your sickness. He can move on your frustration. He can move on your disappointments. He can handle that. He can start doing it right now. But first, you got to be in a place where he can handle your situation. You all remember the prodigal son story, don't you? Boy decided, I wanted my good stuff now, daddy. Before you die, I want my endowment. He left it. He wasted it. What the boy did was he got away from where his protection was. He got away from where his resources were. While there with Jesus, the best thing they need is right there. Only when you're getting away from Jesus do things get crazy. Yes. So here, my friends, Jesus is trying to tell you that I don't need you to wait for tomorrow. I don't want you to wait for two months from now. I want you to know I can deal with your situation right now. Right now. Whatever you got to deal with, I can deal with you right now. So Jesus can handle your right now situation. The second point, my friends, is, is that the disciples needed the sea the provisionary power of Jesus. The disciples needed to see just how powerful Jesus is. Their task was to not only support the ministry of Jesus, but their task was to be prepared to continue the ministry of Jesus. For Jesus knew that his time was short, whether they believed it or heard it or not. His time was short, and that when he left, it was their task, disciples, to carry it forth and to share a word as to who Jesus is and what he can do in your life. And that later on, after they saw him on the tree and saw him also after he had been resurrected and, and had seen them in the open space before he had been resurrected and, and had left the scene and the disciples were then made into apostles because now they had crossed over to their next place. Their task was to now share the gospel, build the church. The disciples needed to see Jesus ain't talking about what he can do. They needed the story. I know for myself of what Jesus can do. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, they, they, they had the task of preaching the gospel. Later on, they were given the authority over evil and sicknesses. And they were given power by Jesus, granted some great authority. But the greatest stories that are told are not because of the words. <clears throat> the greatest stories are often told when someone starts that story by saying, I saw, I was there. And I witnessed. Mm -hmm. And for these, these few men, they needed to be able to say, I know what I saw. Mm -hmm. I can preach the sermon and tell you about the goodness of the Lord, but I know what I saw. Mm -hmm. He took five loaves of bread and two small fishes, and we picked up scraps that filled up 12 baskets. Come on now. And every time somebody had a need, he kept on filling it. Yeah. And every time somebody had a pain in their stomach, he kept on providing. Yeah. And every time somebody wanted, matter of fact, I heard Jones Allergy says that it was a buffet and some of y'all went back twice. Yeah. Don't worry about it because Earl Brown went back four times. <laughs> had some shrimp in his pocket <laughs> and a napkin. Talk about I'm going to take this to pink. <laughs> And so here we find these situations where sometimes it is the greatest blessing to see and to know what Jesus can do. If it's your task to spread it, let me tell you something. And I know some people don't understand where I'm coming from when I say this. But it was one thing to be able to preach the gospel about the goodness of the law. Until in 2018 when I found out that I had cancer. And then in 2019, when I had the surgery, mm -hmm. it was one thing to be able to talk about the goodness of the Lord before I had been through my dark moment. Right. Only to know that when I woke up in that hospital bed and didn't know how I was feeling because I was just glad to still be feeling. Mm -hmm. I woke up with my mind stayed on Jesus. And it was a whole different song at that moment. I could say hallelujah. 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 I was a witness. disciples needed to know for themselves that he is a provider that he is one that will hear and answer your prayers that he is one who will make a way out of a no way situation so yeah Jesus can handle your right now situation but also the disciples needed to see the provisionary power of Jesus that when you talk about him you know he can do it Another point is, is that there is now evidence of his goodness. Mm -hmm. You had hungry people. We got 12 baskets of leftovers. Mm -hmm. Here's where you begin to see that in our lives, the evidence of his goodness is something that we always don't take advantage of. And that is just simply knowing that at the end of the day that our God has provided so much so that there's enough to still give him praise for time and time again. The evidence of his goodness simply is this, that God has been good. And it's not always all the time. Somebody can tell you exactly what that goodness is. Somebody might be able to share with you how I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Somebody has a story. And they bear the evidence of God's goodness. But also the evidence is in these leftovers. Don't you see what the Lord has been doing? You don't see it until you see it. All those situations that didn't always make sense. You don't see it until you see it. Because now we have evidence of his goodness. In other words, when I say evidence of his goodness, don't, don't let nothing be wasted in your life. You know, we celebrate the victories, but don't, but don't necessarily appreciate the struggle. Don't waste your struggle, my friends. There's a story there to be told. We celebrate what God has been doing for the goodness, but we don't stop to take time to tell him thank you. Because there's that just enough of a remnant to let us know that it was not what I did, but what God was doing through me, for me, and because I trusted in him. Here, my friends, don't let anything go to waste. 
There's evidence of his goodness. Don't let any pain go to waste. Some of you are sitting here not because you are special, but because you serve a mighty special God who has built you up from the inside out and has made you to be who you are in his house right now. Oh, my friends, we serve a God who simply said, don't let nothing go to waste. Don't let the people go to waste. Don't let anybody feel like scratch because the importance of leftovers is if it's not what God has already done, watch and see what God will do. importance of leftovers. So the power of Christ here in this text is on full display. For the needs were obvious. The people were tired and the people were hungry. The symbolism of 12 is felt throughout the world, the word of God. Here we find there were 12 sons born to Jacob. Along with these 12 baskets, there's something more that we need to look at. Yes, there's also 12 tribes of Israel. And in the linen ephod that the, price, that the priest would wear, there are 12 precious diamonds that are inlaid on his robe. Right. For Joshua had instructions to get 12 men to now set 12 stones in the middle of the river. Right. The river that was to be set to be a monument to show how the Lord blessed him the cross over the Jordan. Right. Elijah the prophet took 12 stones and built an altar under God. And when the prophet Elisha was called to preach, he was plowing in the field with 12 yoke of oxen. Well. Jesus called 12 disciples who later became his apostles and a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 long years. Jairus' oh. daughter was 12 years old when she died and Jesus raised her back into life. And in the city on high, there are 12 gates. Three Wow. 
watches over me. singing in the choir when we were kids and my grandmama said she wanted me to sing her song. And I didn't know what her song was until I found out what it was. And at the age of 12, I got a chance to sing His Eyes on the Sparrow. I know I was tearing that song up just like the daddy. She didn't care. That's my grandmama. She made me feel so much special. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And even as we were dealing with this sermon, it just started hitting me. This, this symbolisms of people who don't let you feel like leftovers. Yeah. Some of us are born in marriages that didn't work out or we're sometimes made to feel like that stepchild yeah. relationship. You're sometimes made to feel like leftovers or, or, or as if you weren't the important one in certain situations. On the job, you're sometimes made to feel that way even with some of the schools and some yeah. of the kids who are going through ups and downs. Even in the church, we sometimes make feel, some people feel like leftovers. Yes, we, yeah. we have to be careful. Because Jesus put a high value on leftovers that no one might feel as such. I'm going to ask now, if you will, please prepare your offering. Please prepare to give. Amen. Thank you, deacons. Amen. 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 Go and play us through here, deacon. Let him use Lift up your holiness. Now, Lord, if you would just take these offerings and bless it in your holy name. 
lift up your word and help build your kingdom. This prayer, pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling and falling to the all-wise and mighty God be power and glory henceforth now and forevermore. Let us all say, Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.